and color scheme and everything still working on it. I just needed something. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh yeah, it's down here. Okay. Oh, you guys can see my screen. Yep, we can see it. Yes. Which one? The We see Which? what looks like um, speaker notes. Ah, okay. It should be the other one. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, you know what? Uh, give me a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah, when I close my laptop, that works better. Okay, so you know, you can see my screen still, right? Nope. 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 Oh, no? <laughs> uh, wait, did I stop sharing? I think you did. Okay. All right. Now I think we see the correct thing. Okay. Okay. Now it's just cool. the slides, so you're good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So I'm here to discuss my Cascadia R Comp talk. Um, it's going to be called "Learning Together at the Data Science Learning Community." Um, I'm going to start off just by. Ooh, why is that not doing what I want it to? Okay, cool. Just kind of saying a little bit about myself. Um, in my day job, I'm a data scientist at Intel, but my passion project for the last three years has been the data science learning community, formerly known as the RPDS online learning community. So I joined the community in summer 2021, um, a bit before starting my master's of statistics program, and just to kind of help me like get um, familiar with R because it was something I was going to be using in my program. Um, one of the first things I did was join the ggplot2 book club. Um, and that experience was um, what I spoke about at my posit comp talk um, um, the previous summer. Since then, I've facilitated two book clubs, also participated in other book clubs. I'm a community mentor, and also I was asked to be a board member um, this past September. So one of the main things folks in the community already know us for is Tidy Tuesday. Um, so each week we have a curated data set that is put on our GitHub and folks are able to download it and yeah, download it and participants over social media and in Slack, they'll share the data visualizations they made and the code they used to make those data visualizations. Um, at this time, we have over 600 curated data sets, which you could find by going to tidy2s.day. <laughs> um, okay, this one's a blank slide. I'm planning, I wanna put pictures of people's visualizations. I have to look and see which ones to use, um, but yeah. So there's so much more to the data science learning community than just Tidy Tuesday. So for the remainder of talk, that's what I'd like to talk to you all about. So our mission at data science learning community is to provide tools and resources to foster a diverse, friendly and inclusive community of data science learners and practitioners. Um, when we, I should talk about this more. I'll figure that out. Um, yeah, 
And some ways we do that are we have book clubs, um, we have book clubs, help channels, chat channels, and so much more. Um, I guess mentioning somehow cycling into the name change. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So we recently had our name change in this past April, and it was a fairly big change. And we just wanted to align our name to better represent our community. So when we were founded back in 2017, it was specifically to read the book, Art for Data Science. Um, and since then, we've grown tremendously and the community, while still a majority are, we have expanded and we have learners that are learning Python, Julia, JavaScript, and so much more. So, and some of the ways we do that are with our book clubs. Okay. So in our book clubs, we'll, our learners can read anything that's legally available online for free. Um, so that includes, we, of course, we read books, but we also have our, we've also um, read documentation for packages um i'll have to look into that see what else we've read to be able to make sure i cover all the bases <laughs> um and we I do these in, yeah just uh, online courses i think is the only other thing okay that's it i should get a pen paper and pen okay online courses. Okay, cool. Um, so our book clubs, there are small cohort, co small cohorts um, to encourage group discussions. The way we form them, um, someone will request a book in our, request to read a book in our Slack, and we'll need a facilitator for each book club. The main um, the main thing needed to be a facilitator is that you've at least um, engaged in one book club before. And then we use, um, as I mentioned, book coverage. And then we use, an, would book cover be considered an app or what is it considered? It's uh, a shiny, shiny app. Shiny app. Oh, great. Shiny app. Then we use our Book Club or Shiny app to find a time that works for all of our learners um, to engage in our Zoom meetings um, with the facilitator's time being prioritized. Um, and this allows us to have learners from across, across the globe. Um, in the book clubs I've been in, I've had people who are in Europe and in Africa, and it's really cool to like, engage with others, not necessarily just who's, yeah, I'll figure out that. Um, and our meeting recordings are posted to, uh, yeah, I'll work on this part. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Perfect. So another thing we have are our help channels. So in data science and community, it's okay not to know because that's why we're here to help. We have supportive community members and volunteer mentors that are in the chats helping to answer questions. We use a shiny dashboard called Mentor Dash to keep track of the unanswered questions. Um, you could learn more about it by checking out John Harmon, our executive director's talk at our Studio Comp 2020, Learning by Teaching. We also have chat channels, which are a great way to make connections with people in the community. 
yeah very very rough i apologize <laughs> um also something we currently do and hope to expand on are posting um job postings from people in our community um, to help connect our learners with uh, with jobs yeah. chat channels oh I did that. and then one of my favorite parts of the slack is the wins and feedback i think one of the best things one of my favorite parts is just us celebrating one another our wins or even yeah just yeah celebrating one another i'll work on it so yeah um so I hope I've answered any questions you may have about the data science learning community. Um, if you're interested in learning more, please join our Slack, dslc.io slash join. You can help answer questions, facilitate a book club, or contribute to our automation projects. I'll change up with shiny apps. And please connect with us over social media. You can find us on Fostodom, LinkedIn, and I'll add whatever other links later. And that's what I have for now. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thanks. Uh, one thing that I thought of at the end yeah. there, uh, when you get to the conference, go to dslc.io on the conference Wi-Fi, because at NYR, um, because the URL is relatively new, their firewall was blocking us. And it took about five minutes for me to submit a report saying that shouldn't be blocked and it was unblocked, but I didn't do that until after my talk. And so some people tried to go to our site and got blocked. Um, oh, wait. So, you'll, so if you just like on your phone or on a laptop, just connect to the to the conference Wi-Fi and then mm -hmm. go to dslc.io. And I got a page that said, you know, this site is not on our trusted list. You can't go oh. there. And I just had to click like on that page. It said, if if you think this is an error, click here and explain, you know, why it should be allowed. And yeah. it, it was really super painless to fix, but I didn't do it until after when someone said, hey, I can't go to your site. It's like, oh, okay. oh crap. <laughs> so, um, and it's just because we're new, that yeah. URL hasn't existed very long. And so some corporate things block it. Mm. Um, and I didn't think about that being a possibility at the conference. So, um, okay. yeah. So Hopefully, once I do that, it'll make it better for everyone kind of thing? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so um, I'll give myself a reminder. <laughs> yeah, I would say a new thing that I've discovered, like, you know, as, as we do two or three of those, that's probably enough to get it cleared. Yeah. For, for just about everything. Um, but yeah, that was a big, uh, surprise and shock. <laughs> it's like, oh no. Um, so that's something, yeah, definitely, you know, at, at Casca Cascadia, and then I'll have to get someone to do it in Salzburg for use R. Yeah. Just check, make sure it works. And then obviously for posit, I'll do that as soon as I can. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So actually, let me share again, see if any spots you all have suggestions for uh, share desktop again. And yeah, color scheme and everything, big work in progress. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like, so I saw like your shiny comp talk and I kind of, I feel like I wanted to talk about Tidy Tuesday first. I don't know, how do you feel about that? Do you think it makes sense to go into Tidy Tuesday force or first I, describe the yes, community? I, I think that is like, I think there are a lot of ways that you can arrange it, but I think that's one way that, that's one that a lot of people know. And so yeah. point out that thing you might have heard of. Um, one thing that's good to point out about it, make sure people do know that we, you know, it still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on Mastodon and LinkedIn because, yeah. you know, the Twitter API doesn't exist anymore. And so, or whatever, free API doesn't exist anymore. And so people think that it died. Mm -hmm. um, and so just pointing out, you know, you can still find this uh, on various platforms. We're probably going to add Blue Sky before too long. 
um, or just come to our Slack and it's posted there. But yeah, yeah pointing that out is good. Um, okay. I should get an updated number. I'm, we're definitely over 600, but we might be over 700. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay. Let me check that. Um, I mean, over 600 won't be wrong. <laughs> but yeah. It'd be nice to update. <laughs> yeah. That's like, yeah. Uh, I said, I think I had like over 15,000 members for a long time. And then I went to announcements and saw that we have over 18,000 members. It's like, well, I guess over 15,000 is correct, but uh, it's quite a bit over 15,000 now. Okay. And I have to work that mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a mixed bag on talking about how many members we have, because that can scare some people. Um, yeah. So I don't know, be, you know, make sure that you're stressing the friendliness and then I don't think it'll be too stressful. Yeah. Um, let me see. I think you can also emphasize that the book club meetings aren't like super big, like right. small, small, that could help make people are comfortable. Like, Hey, we're, we're a small group. In yeah. the book clubs, it's just that the larger community in the general channel, you, there's that many people. Yeah. Six hundred and fifty-seven data sets. It looks like so. Uh, over six hundred is still fine. Over six fifty, if you want to be a okay. little bit more, whatever. Um, but yeah, I I I do think the small groups for um, book club cohorts is good. Um, I think throwing, like, I mean, you know, you did it in your previous talk, but just throwing in a personal, um, yeah. how it's helpful would yeah. be good. Um, Because, you know, I know myself, there are books that I had had on my shelf for years <laughs> that I finally actually read cover to cover because of book clubs. So that yeah. kind of mention is good, I think. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think I like that you're hitting all the points. I like that you did mention the the future, like emphasizing, you know, the work that we want to take you all the way through from yeah. beginner to actually hired. Um, and then, of course, if you know, if you're changing jobs or anything like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I think the structure is good. I, I think okay. you know, just finish, <laughs> you know, filling it in and practice it a few times and then I think you're yeah. good. I, and I like, I don't think you're far. I, I think if you had to give it tomorrow and just kind of tweak these, it would be okay, but you've got more time than that. So yeah. <laughs> yay. You know? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> and, right. and it's, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to make, or I, I, I do have to make a very similar talk uh, very soon because the, yeah use our I have the virtual uh talk and it's due in a week and a half two weeks something like that um and that one it's a 20 minute talk it, it's funny um you know doing it in person would be cool to go to Austria or whatever but the virtual one it's gonna be on YouTube and like do the instant premiere and promoted worldwide I I guess Ooh. a better audience, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's July second. Um, yeah. so it'll be just after this. So, uh, I don't, but I, I think that mine is due before your you give your talk, mm -hmm. but it will take place after your talk. So, yeah. I, I guess still give me notes of anything you hear because I I'll be in the chat on YouTube. Okay. Um, so I can be ready for questions or whatever. Okay. Sounds good. Um. Yeah. But yeah, it, uh, um, for the last slide, I, I'm tempted to not give them the slash join because we have the slash mm -hmm. join on the site, but get them to go to the main site. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I go back and forth on that thought because uh, getting them into the Slack right away is great, but um 
I don't know. It, it's it's more evergreen. You know, what if we have to leave Slack someday? Yeah. Um, and someone's watching a video of this, the DSLC.io would still work. Actually, slash join would probably still work, but it wouldn't be going to Slack. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's the main thing. And yeah, the connections could change. Oh, on the videos, I do have DSLC.video now, or you can point them to the playlist that way. Um, Oh wait, I need to yeah. try that. I've never tried that. <laughs> what video? Yep. Yeah. There it goes. <laughs> okay. Slow, but yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that was one word. I think it was. Uh, uh, one of the sites had like a sale on dot video and I was like, I didn't even know that existed. And it's kind of, it's one of those where you often have to put in the HTTPS for things to recognize yeah. it as a link. Yeah. But very easy to remember. So, um, yeah, cool. Okay. Cool. Overall, very, cool. you know, like I said, it's, it's on, it, it covers the right beats. Um, I had no idea like length it's hard to say when it's early in the evolution of a talk if the yeah. length is right i can't tell are you trying to talk to us ken because you are muted but your lips were moving oh no <laughs> I, I was I, I wasn't I, there's just a song okay. stuck in my head nothing nothing That's, off topic. I, I, so your head was bopping and so i was like oh, <laughs> he might be singing or he might be talking yeah. to us i can't tell <laughs> yeah. right. but yeah, i do that I, when i'm excited <laughs> all good yeah. okay. all right like like i'm really excited to see this talk you know when it's yeah. all right so i think that's good for me can you ready all right yeah i i'm i'm down for it so let me start sharing okay uh can you see my screen Yes. Okay, that's good. So, right, I'll, I'll start. So, hi, everyone. Um, this is a talk that I'm going to be giving for the Art Cascadia Conference, which is going to happen in June 22nd, uh, 2024 in Seattle, Washington. Um, to start off, I'll introduce myself briefly. So, my name is Ken, and I'll be doing a talk on drawing a Christmas card with the ggplot2 package. Before I start off, I want to give a quick introduction about myself. Um, I got my master's degree in statistics last year in 2023, and a lot of the work in the background and the work I do now in the past involves helping to build and maintain data-driven cultures at different nonprofits and public institutions, ranging from things like conservation cores to even working in administration for, say, colleges, for example. And I also have a math background. I got my undergrad degree in math, where I learned a lot about systems and designing step-by-step solutions to you know everyday um problems using um math as sort of like the base so that's kind of where i'm coming from with my background and with that i want to get started with the talk where before i start i want to go back a year ago in 2023 when i got my master's degree in statistics just to lay the groundwork for what i'll be talking about so Around the time that I got my master's degree in statistics, um, one of the challenges I faced at grad post graduation was keeping up my skills, especially my R knowledge. For I, one of the things that I love about my graduate degree is that I got to learn about the R programming language, which was a language that I enjoyed using a lot because it's very simple to use. Um, it's not as complex as other languages like Java or in some cases, Python or C++, where there's a lot of setup you have to do before you can code anything. And there's a lot that can be done with R, from making graphs to manipulating large amounts of data, all that stuff that I enjoyed doing um, in grad school, as well as my day-to-day -day life at, at work, that I wanted to keep learning even after I got my grad degree. But after I got my master's, I was having a hard time keeping up my knowledge of R. 
a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was out of school. I was trying to figure out my life after college. And I was busy just trying to um, job hunting at the time, which meant that I didn't have a lot of time to practice R, which meant that my R knowledge kind of ended up being rusty and kind of I ended up almost forgetting it over the, the past couple of months since I graduated. Yet despite that, I'm someone who likes to have fun for the holidays. For one of the things I really love about the holidays is just being able to spend time with folks during the Christmas season, whether it's with friends or family, or I like to, you know, this, like the spirit of giving, like giving presents to people, you know, making hot chocolate for people and eating things like gingerbread cookies and all that stuff. And all the beautiful decorations people put out outside their homes sometimes for the holidays, all of it just speaks to that sense of joy that I really love about the holidays. And this was around the time that I was dealing with, you know, keeping up my art, art knowledge, which was around the time of Christmas. And so given where I was coming from, I thought to myself, how do I have fun for the holidays while keeping up my art skills at the same time? And that was a question I started thinking about as I was going through the rest of 2023. And that question ended up, you know, being stuck with me for a while until I recently, recently around the end of 2023, came across some examples of artistry online, which is which are which is when folks use R code to draw art with it, such as the examples that you're seeing here on screen. And just seeing examples like that got me really inspired to think about, okay, what if I could draw something Christmas related using R code for the holidays? I get to do something fun, celebrate the holidays, and keep up my R skills, which gave me an idea of what I want to do um, with with my R knowledge, which leads me to. Something I'm going to want to ask you all before I move on is, do you want to build a snowman or ride your bike around the hall? Look, I know that Christmas is six months away, but I want to be Elsa. I want to let it go. I want to build a snowman. So let's do that and more. And so with all that R knowledge, I built this Christmas card using nothing but R code to build it, which I got ready in time for Christmas that ended up being a lot of fun making and really putting a lot of work in, which I'm gonna give you a sense of how I built it within the next couple of slides. Starting with the design process. How did I, what was the thinking that went into building this card? Which starts with the first part, sketching it. One of the things that I like to do before I do on a project like this is I like to draw a sketch, like a rough draft of what I wanted on my on this project before I start coding right away. Because it helps to get an idea of whether or not my ideas are realistic, helps to see <clears throat> where, um, see what it might look like so I can get a clear sense of what am I trying to build. All these things to help me to stay focused. So here in this case, I knew I wanted to build a Christmas car, but then there comes the question, what is going to be on the Christmas card. So here I drew a rough sketch of a Christmas tree, some decorations on it, and a snowman, all of which gave me a rough idea of what I wanted on this Christmas card, which then ended up informing what is, ends up actually being on it. And um, and you, see, you can see here, um, there are some measurements here where I specified how wide I want the Christmas tree to be, tree to be and how tall it's going to be, as well as some coordinates here, a lot of which ties to my bath background, for I love ha being organized with how I I manage my workflow, having ex being precise about where things are, and this I'll explain later on. But just know that you know I'm very methodical with how I do things, and having a sketch like this helps me to kind of imagine what the outcome's going to look like, so I can focus my energy a little bit more on how to how to get there. So I have the sketch. Next comes. What do I use to build this card? So for this one, I use the ggpot2 package to draw my Christmas card for several reasons. It's a popular package. It's familiar. For I've used this a lot for my graphs for, that I build. And it's super customizable. For There's a lot of things that you can plot with this package from scatter plots to bar charts or even just um, even draw shapes with it. And all these little things and customize like the color, size, or shape of points, all of which makes ggpot2 excellent for a complicated project like this. 
And there's also other packages I've used to build this card, such as extra font. So I can load in some custom fonts that can use for any text that I write on the card, such as that Happy Holidays um, greeting that I showed you earlier on the card, which was which was created with a custom font that I loaded in. And there's also the package dplyr to make it easier for me to manipulate and move around large amounts of data. Not necessary, but it makes things a lot faster, especially with a project of this level of complexity. And here's the code chunk that I used to load in those three libraries I mentioned, ggplot2, font, and dplyr. All right, now that I have everything set up, I have a sketch show I want to create and the tools that I'd pick to build this card, then comes actually plotting this card. But before I get into it, I want to go over quickly about this concept of the grammar of graphics, which is very important in terms of how ggplot2 works when it comes to plotting things. So as a general overview, the grammar of graphics, you can think of it as sort of a way of thinking when it comes to how to build graphs and how to visualize them. A way to organize and prepare your data so that way it can be visualized. And read. So think of it as a mix of systems and rules and generally how you should think about things when it comes to plotting. And this grammar of graphics usually has three parts to it. The data which is what information that you want to show on the graph, which is the most important part. As without data, there's, there's no graph. And then there's also the aesthetic mapping, which is, okay, now you have your data, where in the graph that you want to put it? It's like arranging furniture. You, you say, I want a couch, but where in the room do you want to put the couch? So you can think of aesthetic mapping as a, a way to basically tell the tool that you're going to use to graph things where do you want it specifically? Do you want it along the edges of the graph? Do you want it inside the graph? And so aesthetic mapping is a way to figure that out. And then there's geometries, which is how do you want your data to be shown? How do you want it to be represented? Do you want it to be a scatter plot, a box plot, or bar chart? All these things that help determine how it will look in the end. And so these three elements, the data, aesthetic mapping, and geometries are three essential ingredients that make up the grammar of graphics or the theory as to how you would approach graphing. Additionally, um, it comes to plotting, in this case, using with ggplot2. One thing's important to know is that ggplot2 plots things on a coordinate system where there's an X axis at the bottom, which goes from left to right horizontally, which tells you where an object or a point is um, uh, horizontally, and then it has a y-axis where it tells you where objects are vertically, going up or down. And this is a way, it works like a GPS, a way to tell where objects are, a way to easily find them using this system. And when it comes to plotting, um, ggplot2 typically plots things in forms of points, which are typically thought of in the format of xy, with x telling you where is it along the x-axis, and then the y, the, the second number in the parentheses being where it is vertically on the y-axis. So for example, the point negative one, negative one on the bottom left here on this graph means that along x, you go to negative one. And then the, the second number, negative one, you go up the y-axis to find negative one. And then you follow the grid lines to connect where those two intersect. And that's how points are plotted in ggplot2. And with that, that's a little bit of the groundwork of how ggplot2 plots things and how it all works under the surface, which takes me to the fun part, which relates, or actually before I get into that, um, because of the coordinate system, it's here. That's why going back to the sketch, there's all these coordinates here because that's how ggplot2 plots things. It needs a system to figure out where to put things. And so using the measurements of how big or how wide I want parts of the Christmas tree is, for example, I use that to build a set of points, coordinates, with an X and a Y, so that way I know where things are going to be located. And while not perfect, it helps to tell ggplot2 where I want things, so that way it gets the dimensions right and how big or how tall the objects are going to be. And now with a lot of that groundwork set up, then comes the fun part, plotting a ggplot2. So... As a base example, I'm going to focus primarily on drawing the, the top of the Christmas tree or like this upper part, the green part of the Christmas tree without the decorations 
as it is a lot of code to build this card, which is a lot to cover within 15 minutes, but I'm going to sort of focus more on that, that part, just so I can show you all like the thinking, general thinking that went to building it. So with that, let's start with the first step with comes to plotting. So the first step when it comes to plotting in ggplot2 is to pick a ggplot2 function to draw what you want. As there's a ton of functions out there, there's geom point on the left for scatter plots, where you want, if you want to plot a bunch of dots, you have that option. And there's geom polygon on the right to draw shapes, where you have a set of points, it'll connect the dots together to form a shape with it. So in this case, it's forming the shape of a diamond, but you can also draw other shapes as well, besides shapes like this. And so given that I want to draw a Christmas tree, which isn't like a normal conventional shape, like a circle or a square, I picked geom polygon, this, this function shown on the right as an example. I picked that to be the func my go-to for drawing the Christmas tree. And so I'm using geom polygon for that. And then next, I took, you may recall the, the points that I put on my sketch. I used those points that, that I built and then translated into our code where I input it into this data structure called a triple that allows me to set up how many columns I'm going to have, and then arrange all these points where all the Xs are on one column, all the Ys are on one column. So I take all these points and then translate them into our code, as you're seeing here, going from the sketch on the left to the R code on the right and inputting it. So that way ggplot2 knows where the, co the coordinates are. Then comes the process of plotting this part, top part of the Christmas tree, where first you want to call ggplot, and then next, we go to that chosen um, ggplot2 function. So in this case, geom polygon, where when it comes to plotting anything in ggplot2, you specify your data. In other words, where you get your data from. In this case, all the points that I set up to build this tree. And then the mapping, okay, where things are going to be. So the x coordinates that I set up earlier goes with x. x axis y go goes with the y coordinates for the y axis. And then lastly, at the bottom here, there's an extra argument where you can change different aesthetics. So in this case, I made the inside of the Christmas tree green using the fill argument. And there certainly are other arguments, but those are examples of the amount of customization that you can do with ggplot2, which putting it all together gets you this top part of the Christmas tree without the decoration and all that. And while this is a small example compared to the, all the other things I did with the card, this is an example of the general set of steps I followed with all the parts of this Christmas card right here, which was built using similar steps as I did with the tree, just that with different functions and different points, all of which putting it all together helped to build all these elements on the on this card here, from the tree to the ornaments, to the sashes wrapped in the tree, the star at the top, the snow on the ground, the snow that's falling, and the snowman as, as well. All of which took me three days to prepare, debug, and ultimately think about to achieve this card, which by the way, could have been done a lot faster in a drawing app like Microsoft Paint, but I did it anyway for it really helped me to practice my knowledge of R and, and keep it preserved, challenge myself, and ultimately have something fun for the holidays on top of three things that I surprisingly did not expect I would learn from this entire process which takes me to this conclusion. What are three things that I took from this whole project? So one of them was I learned more about how the ggplot2 library works from all these new functions that I never heard of before to even just getting more practice plotting with ggplot2. I also got better at being organized with the project like this. As I did show you my little process for um, how I built this card from sketching it to visualize what I want to then planning out how am I going to build it and then running the code, all of which helps me to stay organized as well as, you know, save a lot of time when it comes to planning and getting this done by Christmas. And lastly, I think the most important lesson of all was be yourself as you can do it, as, <clears throat> as every idea and perspective matters. And there's no such thing as a silly idea for the it 
for the more different ideas out there, perspectives or different ways of learning, the more diversity there is and the more we can inspire change and innovation and ultimately more progress in the world that we live in. So no matter what, always believe in yourself and know that you can do it, whatever you're doing. And with that, that's the end of this presentation. Thank you all so much. If you're curious about the code that I used to build these slides in the card, you can scan this QR code here or go to the links here or connect with me here on social media. And thank you all so much for tuning in and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Any thoughts? Anything? Thank you, though, by the way. <laughs> oh, you saw the comment? Very nice. Oh, yeah. hey, comment? Where? In oh, chat. Gabby. Oh, oh, Gabby. Oh, I see. I just see. I just saw it now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Yes, you can do it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. Uh, anything else? Any thoughts? Um, or? So I know I know I already suggested it. Um, I'm wondering because I know you took out a lot of the code. Um, the code. No, I said I know you took out a lot of the code in yeah. some of those pictures. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I... I'm wondering. I do like that one where um, like kind of the one where you showed what it looked like before resizing it and stuff like that. I don't know if you want to add more code. If not, perfect. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I hope I didn't make you take out all the code. Yeah. Oh, no worries. Yeah. It was just, yeah, because um, originally, I guess for context for everyone who's listening, originally it was supposed to be a walkthrough of how he built each part of the, the card, but then I ended up taking it out a lot because I felt like it was just so much. Not to mention, like, I have a blog where I do talk about it in detail. And so I think, Lydia, to your point, um, I remember, I know you kind of talked about this, but I ended up kind of restructuring where I just showed them the general theory behind what I did. Yeah, because I wanted to give them like kind of example of like how they could do it. At least show them in detail rather than just giving them a whole bunch of code that kind of would. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Echo Gabby, link to the blog post. Oh yeah, sure. Let, let me Let me stop sharing. I'll send it. Yeah. I'm even wondering, like, even mentioning the blog post in the thing, in the presentation, so people know they can see all your steps. That would be cool. Oh, oh yeah, that that'd be cool. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, you can hear me. Yeah, I yeah. do have the blog post. If anything, I can put that in my um link tree. Just be like, hey, you want to read up more how exactly I built it? Here's the code. Yeah. Uh, link to, yeah, because I was trying to, because I realized that, you know, if I gave like a how to do it, then it might be too overwhelming. So I just gave him, okay, th let's plot this little, this, this one part. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Thanks, Gabby. Yeah. But yeah, so overall, I feel like, I'm I'm pretty good with this structure where like just show like a tiny example of why plot because it's a essentially what I built used to build the car was a lot of repetition. Just the same set of steps, but with different functions and different points. Yeah. But overall, it seems like it's it's working pretty out well. Yeah. Very cool. Because yeah, I had no idea how the code from before translated into the tree. So now seeing them side by side, I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's how it works. So yeah, I really like that you're explicitly showed that part, like the tree itself next to the code. I really like that. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And and yeah, th and thanks though. Like I learned from the best.
Awesome. Okay, I think that's it, unless anyone has something for you. Otherwise, I can return the floor. I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. And yeah, it looks great. Looking forward to hearing it at Cascadia. Oh, thanks, Gabby. I think right. we're good. I think we're good, John. Yeah, that was great. I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that we had this so that you guys could practice and get some feedback. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I don't, I don't know if we have anyone signed up for next month, but if not, um, at any time, people are welcome to sign up to present. Um, we don't have anyone yet, so, uh, that'll be July thirteenth. Um, and I look forward to seeing everyone then. Um, and yeah, with that, I will see everyone on Slack. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank oh, you. And I already put end in the chat. I don't know if you want oh. to end it again. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, the, and the oh. comments are going to be posted. Or like, because I know you do with the the looks the, um, the yeah the like project club that, meetings. Yeah, the comments will be auto posted. Um, do you here? I'll go ahead and end.